Counsel? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good afternoon. This case is not about who did it. Ms. Walker is correct because Guillermo Areola was shot and killed by Dean Cummings. There's no dispute in that. So the question before the court, before the jury, isn't who killed him, but why. And the evidence is going to explain to you why that happened. The facts that led up to the death of Mr. Areola. Mr. Cummings told the police when he called 911 that day, he called them and he told them, my name is Dean Cummings. I just shot and killed a man in self-defense. So he told the police that right away. And he told David McCullough that right away. Because after this shooting happened, Mr. Cummings reacted. He was in the middle of nowhere. And you're going to hear evidence, and Ms. Walker showed you some overhead photos of where this occurred, the ranch where this occurred. It was out in the middle of nowhere. It's a remote area. There is no cell phone service out there, not for miles. It's a place that is so remote. There are no neighbors. There's no other buildings. You have to drive for miles before you reach anyone or anything. And that's where Mr. Cummings found himself on February 29th, 2020. Because as you heard from Ms. Walker, and you will hear in the evidence, Mr. Cummings was looking to purchase some land. He grew up in New Mexico, Los Alamos to be specific. He grew up here. He spent his childhood in New Mexico before leaving for Colorado and then Alaska. And then in 2019, he returned to New Mexico. Mr. Cummings is an outdoorsman. He's a man who loves to be out in the wilderness, to be out in remote areas, to live off the land. And so he was looking for a piece of land back home here in New Mexico where he could build a home, start a new life. And Mr. Ariola owned property that he, was what he was looking for. This property out there, out near San Luis, San Ysidro area, near Cabazon Peak. Remote, beautiful land. So Mr. Cummings and Mr. Ariola were planning this real estate transaction. And Mr. Cummings was excited about his future. And you're going to hear evidence about this real estate contract that they were negotiating. And Mr. Cummings had every intention of buying that land. And in the meantime, he was permitted to stay out there. He put his RV out there. And he was allowed to stay in this little trailer. Mr. Ariola encouraged him to stay out there, encouraged him to get to know the land, the property, the trailer. There were some horses out there. Mr. Cummings was helping take care of the horses, feeding them. And that's what led up to this incident on February 29th. Mr. Cummings was staying there, as he had been told and encouraged to do, when Mr. Ariola showed up. He showed up unexpectedly. Mr. Cummings and Mr. Ariola started talking about this real estate contract, and they started arguing. It was a verbal argument in the kitchen of this small trailer. And while they were arguing, all of a sudden, Mr. Ariola attacked Mr. Cummings. Without any warning, Mr. Cummings was all of a sudden fighting for his life. Mr. Ariola and Mr. Cummings were in this physical altercation. It led down this very short hallway to a small bedroom. And it was during this physical altercation that Mr. Cummings realized that Mr. Ariola had something in his right hand. You're going to hear testimony Mr. Ariola was right-handed. You're going to hear testimony that Mr. Ariola routinely carried a canister of mace with him. Mr. Cummings didn't know exactly what it was, but all he knew was that he was being struck with this thing in Mr. Ariola's hand over and over again. During this altercation, 
Mr. Cummings was able to grab his rifle that he had had sitting there. He had recently purchased a scope and was putting the scope onto the, onto the rifle, which is why it was sitting there. He grabbed the rifle, and he and Mr. Ariola started fighting over this rifle. And it was during this struggle, Mr. Cummings has one hand on this rifle, he has his other hand blocking, his left hand blocking Mr. Ariola, who's re repeatedly striking him. During this, this struggle between these two men, all of a sudden, Mr. Cummings realized that his eyes were starting to burn, his lungs were starting to burn. Something had been sprayed. He didn't know what this stuff was. But at the same time he starts to feel this burning sensation, he feels Mr. Ariola pulling on the rifle. They're fighting over control over this gun. Whoever wins is gonna live, whoever loses was gonna die. And during the struggle over this gun, the cap on the scope of the rifle comes off. And that's important, and you're gonna see the evidence, you're gonna see photos of that cap. That cap had been taped onto the scope with electrical tape. Mr. Cummings had taped the cap on with electrical tape, so it was on there good. And you'll see photos, and you're gonna see the evidence that shows that the cap from that scope ended up underneath Mr. Ariola's body because it came off during a physical fight for control of that gun. During this struggle for the gun, shots went off. You're going to see photos of bullet holes in the trailer. That is important because those bullet holes, or we call them impact sites, a lot of times that's what we refer to them as, those impact sites tell the story of what really happened in that trailer. And you're going to hear from an expert who's going to explain that to you but some of those bullets sprayed down the hallway and out of the trailer. Three. Three bullets went out the trailer on the other side. The other side of the trailer from where the small bedroom was. And that shows how this fight was progressing and continuing as these men are fighting each other for control of this gun. They end up in this small bedroom and Mr. Cummings ends up basically trapped in that room. Mr. Ariola's in front of him. The only way for him to escape is through Mr. Ariola. And you're going to see other impact sites on the floor in that bedroom. And those impact sites are really important. And you're going to have an expert who's going to explain to you why those impact sites are so important. And the reason that those impact sites are so critical is because what they're going to show you is that at some point during that struggle, the gun that ultimately killed Mr. Ariola, that firearm was upside down, almost on the ground, when it went off. Again, the evidence will show that that gun was upside down, literally almost on the ground, when two shots were fired. That shows you that there was a physical fight a struggle occurring over that firearm. You're going to see that firearm. It's going to be in this courtroom. You're going to have a chance to look at it. And it's important that you take a close look at that firearm. Technology. <laughs> it should, there's a light. There you go. There we go. You'll get going. There we go. 
This is a photo of that gun that was taken by an investigator with the Office of the Medical Investigator. What you're looking at there, this is the AR-15 that was involved in this struggle. What you see there is some kind of residue or spatter that dried on that firearm that is consistent with Mr. Cummings' story that something was sprayed at him that day during that struggle while they're fighting over that gun. You're going to be able to look at that firearm when it's in this courtroom. So those are the two important things about that firearm that the evidence is going to show. One, this residue or spatter that dried on the gun, and two, that the muzzle created those marks on the floor, showing that that gun was literally on the floor or almost on the floor when it went off at least twice. You're going to hear evidence from Dr. Gerald with the Office of the Medical Investigator, as Ms. Walker indicated. Officer Gerald conducted the autopsy of Mr. Ariola. And there's a, a couple of important details that she's going to tell you about what that autopsy revealed. First, the trajectory of those bullets. Mr. Ariola was shot and killed by two bullets. Both of those bullets entered in a right to left trajectory, one through his temple and downward, downward and ended up in his chest. The other one entered on the right side of his chest and went through and exited on the left side. So those two bullets, both right to left in a downward trajectory. Dr. Gerald will be testifying to that and you'll probably see some photographs that also help to demonstrate some of that. The other thing that she's going to tell you is that Mr. Ariola was intoxicated at the time of this altercation. He was intoxicated on alcohol, he had cocaine in his system, and he had marijuana in his system. And Dr. Gerald will explain to you the significance of that combination of alcohol and cocaine when it's in someone's system at the same time. You're going to see photographs that detailed the scene. And again, I explained, you're going to see photographs of those impact sites that tell you the story of what happened in that trailer. The impact sites that go down the hall out of the trailer, the other impact sites next to Mr. Ariola's body that show that the gun was on the floor when it went off. And you're going to also hear testimony from an expert by the name of Aaron Brudinell. Mr. Brudinell is a forensic scientist who has spent decades working with the Arizona Department of Public Safety. He is a forensic scientist. His full-time job is working for the prosecution in Arizona. He analyzes crime scenes, especially when there, um, is, uh, there are firearms involved, and he reconstructs shootings. He took the evidence that was gathered by the New Mexico State Police and the Sandoval County Sheriff's Department he took that evidence and he examined it and he reconstructed what happened in that trailer that day. Mr. Brudinell is going to testify that he closely examined those impact sites that I've just briefly described for you. And he's going to tell you that the physical evidence that he saw is consistent with some kind of physical struggle occurring over that firearm. So at the end of this trial, there is not going to be a dispute about the fact that Mr. Cummings did shoot and kill Mr. Ariola. And the evidence is going to show that he acted in self-defense. The evidence is also going to show that he did not conceal his identity at any point in time. In fact, the evidence will show that he placed a 911 call to the police identifying himself and explaining what had just happened in that trailer. The state has also charged Mr. Cummings with tampering with evidence, and I'm just going to briefly address what the evidence is in that. The state is going to ask you to convict him of tampering with evidence because he washed his face, washed his hands, and removed his clothing after 
this incident occurred. However, what did Mr. Cummings do with that evidence? What did he do with his clothing? Well, the prosecution's own witnesses are going to testify that Mr. Cummings put his clothes on the back of his pickup truck. And the prosecution's own witnesses are going to tell you that when the police arrived on scene, he told them where his clothing was. He asked them to collect his clothing and test it for whatever he had just been sprayed with. So the evidence is going to show that Mr. Cummings acted in self-defense, that he did not tamper with evidence, and that he did not conceal his identity. That is what this evidence will show. Thank you. The state will now present its evidence. After the state has presented its evidence, the defendant may present evidence, but it's not required to do so because the burden is always on the state to prove defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. State, you may call your first witness. Your Honor, the state will call Deputy Hayden Walker. Okay. Are you going to address the witness? You're going to address the witness, right? Turn yes, sir. One, uh, another 90 degrees. There we go. Deputy, before you take the stand, I'll need to swear you in. Raise your right hand, please. Yeah, we're ready. Do you no, swear? No, we don't need that. No, we don't need that. No. Do you swear <coughs> upon the testimony you're about to give is the truth on the penalty of law? I do. You're going to take a seat. 